This morning I want to uh, talk about contemplating citta, the third of the um, domains of mindfulness. We've already touched on this with the, using the thought stream as a meditation object. This is how the Buddha begins uh, talking about this practice. He says, how does a bhikkhu live contemplating citta as citta? Here a bhikkhu knows citta accompanied by passion as citta accompanied by passion and citta free from passion as citta free from passion. He knows citta accompanied by aversion as citta accompanied by aversion and citta free from aversion as citta free from aversion. He knows citta accompanied by delusion as citta accompanied by delusion and citta free from delusion as citta free from delusion. So, he talks about, he begins by talking about the three basic movements of the, of, of, of the mind. Attraction, aversion, delusion. These, these are the three basic movements of the mind or of the heart. Attraction is the movement towards something, to hold on. Aversion is the movement away, to resist or reject. Delusion is both not knowing what the experience is and a response of confusion and bewilderment, want, don't want, want, don't want, um, flopping between the, the possibilities. Out of these three basic movements arise what we call the emotions. So out of attraction would be desire, lust, passion, greed, ambition, love, faith, and so on. Out of aversion, anger, irritation, ill will, boredom, and so on. Delusion, out of delusion you get dullness, confusion, doubt, and so on. So, so when the Buddha starts to talk about the citta, he talks about what colours it, what's moving it, what's informing it. The citta is uh, central to his whole project because when he talks about liberation and he talks about bondage, what is it that's liberated? It's the citta. What is it that's bound? It's the citta. So getting to know the citta is very important. Getting to know how the heart is moved, what, is it, what moves it and how is it moved, is extremely important for the way that we live. Citta is usually translated mind, uh, we talked about the inadequacy of this translation. Mind, for us, is too heady. It's too abstract. It's too much disconnected from emotion. Sometimes you can you know, chitta could be translated as heart, because uh, it captures that sense of the seat of the emotions as well as the seat of thinking. Sometimes you see it translated as heart mind, as a compromise. You could translated as soul in the original meaning of that word, the alive center of a person. In the Satipatthana Sutta it's not given an exact definition. It is used in the sense, in the general sense of how one is at this time. The aware center of a person. When we look inside and ask, well, how are we? What's going on? with me, then what we're uh, looking at or talking about is the citta. Citta is very close to Vedana, feeling, and the way into citta is often through feeling. Feeling and, and citta are very, very close. Not quite the same, but very close. Sometimes, because these concepts get so subtle, it's, it can be hard to figure out, well, what's this? Is this Vedan or is this Jitta or what? And it's best just to not worry about it. Uh, the concepts are useful after the fact. You know, first become intimate with the experience, then worry about which label to put on it. But usually when we, we talk about the contemplating the Jitta, usually people stumble into it through emotion. One of the major barriers to going deep in meditation practice is the disturbed citta. 
The Buddha says that, it, that, that the normal citta is like a fish that's just been pulled out of the water by a fisherman and it's been slapped onto the wharf. And so the fish is, is just jumping and bouncing around in a complete panic. And this is the normal state of the citta, this constant movement and, and, and panic. The citta is always changing, it's not stable, it's not permanent in any sense. And it's normally disturbed. So when we practice, we come up against our disturbances. So we, we come in to do something as simple as sit and feel the breathing, and we find that our, our heart, our heart or our mind gets in the way. We're disturbed, we're agitated. And often it's the emotions. So often the, 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 the major barrier to, to settling in, into the practice is our disturbed emotions. So we need to include those in the meditation practice. They are part of the practice. Working with emotion in meditation, I think it's important to recognize what we're doing. We're not trying to solve our emotional problems through meditation. Sometimes people use meditation retreats to try to work through problems. Um, sometimes people come to retreats not simply when they are in emotional crisis, but because they are in emotional crisis. Generally, I think this is not a particularly good idea. But so we, sometimes we bring a, to a, a meditation retreat some problem that we want to solve. But the meditation is not about solving problems. The contemplation of the citta is not, and, and becoming intimate with, him, with our emotions, our disturbed emotions, is not about solving our emotional problems. It's about seeing and understanding the emptiness of emotion. That emotion, like any, anything else, arises and ceases dependent upon conditions. It's not me. It doesn't belong to me. It's just stuff coming and going. I remember years ago, Robert Aitken Roshi, my old Zen teacher, used to say, do not use a retreat to work things through. Things will be worked through, but don't use the retreat to work things through. And it, it's very good advice. Don't use the retreat to solve your problems problems will be resolved through the practice, but don't use the practice to resolve problems. If we use the, the practice to resolve problems, we're constantly manipulating the experience and constantly imposing our agenda on it. But if we allow the practice to unfold, the Dharma will sort things out. Uh, and we, we don't have to do it. So we're not trying to, if we're working with emotion, we're not trying to solve emotional problems. We're trying, we're, we're becoming intimate with emotion, that's all. Emotion is complex. And it's interesting that, uh, well I, I remember being struck once when I was reading about uh, how meditation being used to deal with emotion and so on. And it suddenly struck me that I, that I didn't know the Pali word for emotion. And um, I thought about it and I kind of looked things up. I actually looked up the English Pali dictionary and I found two or three words, all of them compounds, all of them late. In other words, the Buddha never seemed to actually talk about them. I reflected on this and talked to a, a friend of mine who's also a meditator and a Pali teacher. And we concluded that no, the Buddha actually never talked about them, what we call emotion, because for him that would be too, too crude a, uh, a category. He was much more precise than that. If you look at emotion, it's made up. It's, I mean, emotion is always complex. It's made up of different parts. If there's an emotion, if we can identify an emotion, then usually there's a narrative. So if I'm angry, for instance, I'm angry at someone for something. So there's a story attached. So that's thinking. 
a narrative going through the mind, the images, the attachment to the images, and so on. Emotion is often felt in the body. We talk about you know, holding the emotion. You know, I, felt, I felt this in my gut. It, that really gutted me. That, you know. So it's like we hold the emotions in the body, often, usually in this part of the body. So emotion usually has a physical component, which is body. Emotion always has what the Buddha calls Vedana. To, to, to really to have an emotion, it's got to be either painful or pleasant. So that quality of painfulness or pleasantness, which is feeling, Vedana. Emotion is always complex. It's made up of different parts. And any one of these parts can become a meditation object. And we can see how each part feeds the other. So if I'm feeling pissed off, for example, and then I start running a story. The story feeds the emotion, the emotion feeds the story, the story feeds the emotion, the emotion feeds the story, they, they bounce off each other. If I cut through that and focus just on the story, on the fact of thinking, or just on the, the emotion itself, then that self-supporting system is cut through and the whole thing begins to, to wind down. So. We have narrative, we have the affective feel, the feeling tone, we have the body sensation, but we also have something else. An emotion has, or here we, we'll use the term chitta, has a felt essence to it. It's unique flavour to it. At the core of it, it's like some kind of sensitivity at the very core of the emotion. Take, for example, anger. When you really get down to it and really feel it, it's got a very energetic feel to it. It's one of the reasons why it can be so attractive. It's kind of um, energetic, hard, sharp, moving. Sorrow has a kind of a, a soft quality to it. It's much more gentle and even it's moist. Whereas anger can be quite dry. Different emotions have, it's like when we get down to the essence of, of, of it, they have quite distinct characteristics. Very difficult to put into words. And it's this felt essence that we're aiming at in the contemplation of the citta it can be useful to use the body as a, um, a vehicle. So for example, if I notice, if I'm in the grip of some disturbing emotion, a very good question to ask is, well, where is it in the body? So I might find it in the body somewhere. And then put the awareness there, but it's not the awareness isn't going on to the sensation so much <coughs> as through the sensation to what's underneath it, that, that essence of it. If I can't find it specifically in a, in a specific location, often if I'm working with emotion, I'll put the awareness in the heart area and you know, be following the breath, say, in, but in the heart area, and that often opens it up. And using the naming, so I recognise an emotion. Sometimes I recognise it through the narrative. So if I'm thinking about something that I want, then I might recognise, ah, oh, there's wanting. Or sometimes it comes up deeper, like in the body, and then there's the narrative. Sometimes I recognise wanting and then start to think about what I want. For me, when, when that happens, it's usually the, uh, the emotion is, is more deep-seated when I recognise it first and the narrative comes second. So f finding it and tracking it can be quite subtle. Using the naming is very important here uh, because it's, it's non-physical. It can be quite subtle. So if I'm in the grip of an emotion, to allow myself to feel it completely, to drop the, keep dropping the story, 
the focus, the interest isn't on the narrative, but going into the body where I feel the emotion itself and name it, just as it is. I remember one time in Burma when I was, I did a, um, about six months of meditation practice and I was going through a very hard time. The first six weeks were hell and I graduated to purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I went through a, a lot of suffering on that uh, particular retreat. It was my. It was. It was the, the time to go through to thoroughly investigate dukkha, which I did. And one of the, for a while, I was going through very strong emotion, particularly anger and sorrow. These were my favourites at the time. And when when I would notice sorrow coming. And it, was like, it would be like a, this little cloud in the distance. And I could, oh, it's on the way. And as soon as I, as soon as I felt it coming, I'd head into my room. We all had those little private individual cells. And I would lie on my bed for the meditation because I didn't want to weep in public. So I lie on the bed and weep convulsively. And through the, so the body was doing its thing. And through the mind was running the narrative that the tragedy of my life. But I knew that that wasn't where it was at. I didn't believe it. I mean, the mind was tossing it up, but I knew that it wasn't true. My awareness kept going into sorrow. Sorrow. And it was in, in the body. Um, and just again and again and again and again, just naming it. Sorrow. Sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. Letting the body do its thing, letting the mind do its thing. And uh, it was really interesting. I was having a really good time. If, it, if anybody had seen me, they would have thought, oh, you're having such a terrible time. <laughs> but actually, it was, it was really interesting. It was fascinating. And then suddenly, it'll be gone. And I'll be lying there, whoops. Time to get up now. <laughs> Out of bed, return to the meditation hall. When I was working on anger, I stayed in the hall. But I, wouldn't, I, I, I did it in standing posture because there's more, there's more room in standing posture. And anger has this incredibly energetic feel to it. So I'd be standing, eyes wide open, like wide open, and this rage coming out. And I always think of the... the um, ABC program, where it starts off, rage. <laughs> and that's what I was noting, you know, and it was rage, <laughs> just pouring out, you know. And I w would wonder what someone looking at me would, would see. Would they see this person possessed by rage, or would they see this meditator in doing really good standing meditation, perfectly still? Strangely enough, he's got his eyes open. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> And again, it was really interesting. It was fascinating. And again, poof, gone. Just vanished. When, it, when we really become intimate with the emotions, they just sweep through and come and go. They're like, it's like the weather. You know, it's, it's pelting down with rain. And then suddenly, poof, storm's over, bright sunshine. Finish. Nothing left. Nothing to hold on to. It's fascinating. Since then, the emotions have really calmed down. The last time I had any, anything of interest was some years ago when I was doing a retreat in the Blue Mountains. And the, the, the retreat centre is on a slope and the, and the meditation hall is down towards the bottom. And I was walking down to the hall f uh, feeling that I didn't want to go there. And I thought, this is interesting, resistance. And so I started to, as I was walking down the steps, started to go in and to to feel it and to note it. And it's then turned into this kaleidoscope of different, what's usually called negative emotions, one after the other. Doom, 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 doom. By the time I got to the hall and walked in, I started doing walking meditation because I, was, I like to do it in, you know, this kind of thing is, I like to do it in walking. And it had resolved into despair. And the despair was in my groin. 
And I thought, this is really seriously interesting. I never knew I carried my despair in my groin. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected to have found it there. <laughs> so, so I started walking down the hall. And to my great disappointment, by the time I got to the end of the first walking track, it had vanished. And I was really pissed off because I, I was really, I was exploring it. It was fascinating, especially this groin business. But it was gone, and it hasn't come back since. And it's, it's kind of, sometimes I regret this. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it's like when you, when you it, it becomes seriously interesting. But, and the key is, don't take it personally. Because it's not personal. It's just emotion, that's all. And it comes and goes, dependent upon condition. But the key is to find the, the, the center of it. One, one time when it was very clear to me was, was when I was, I forget what the emotion was, it was, it was aversion, some form of aversion, which is my favorite forms of emotion. But I was feeling it and noting it in the heart area and it got down to, and it's, it sounds really weird, but it's like when you get really down to it, language doesn't quite fit. It was like this very open, pink, soft, incredible sensitivity that any, anything striking it, anything like from the outside world, um, sight, sound and so on, or anything from the inner world of thought and feeling and so on, would strike that, that chitta and it, it was so sensitive that it would... <laughs> and if you see a see a, a, a cat go <laughs> when it gets disturbed, it would just <laughs> out because of the sensitivity of it. And it was that that's the basic, you know, sensitive reaction. And then if you go up layer and layer and layer and layer of mental processing and thought and so on, at the top it would emerge as an emotion. But what it was at the core was just this because of the sensitivity of it at the time. Again, it was fascinating to see, to watch it, and you start to, to understand, oh, this is how the emotions arise, and this is, where they, this is where they come from, this is what they do. And again, it's not personal. It's just what they do. So, incorporating the emotions in the, 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 chit, the chitta in the practice is very important, Never taking them personally. Use the naming and go for the essence, the felt essence of the emotion. Any questions or comments? Yeah, the, the, the naming is about aim. If you can aim accurately without the name, then you don't need the name. Um, my main teacher, Sayadaw Upandita, was very strong on the names. Uh, and he, one time uh, he explained that the naming is like when, you, when you're in kindergarten and you're learning the alphabet and the teacher puts up a big chart on the wall and the chart's got all the letters of the alphabet. So top left-hand corner, there's this big A, and beside it is a picture of an apple. Then there's a there's big B, beside it, the picture of a cricket bat. There's a big C, and beside it, a picture of a cat, and so on. And the teacher's up there with a long pointer, and everyone's chanting, A is for apple, B is for bat, C is for cat, and so on. That's the naming. <laughs> <laughs> it's very basic. It's like, oh, this, this, this. So it's about aim and, and refining aim. If, it's not, if you don't need it, we well, don't use it. If you can just read, well, we just read. But people can s learn how to read by using these, these pointers. Sometimes uh, it's useful either when you notice that you're being sloppy, 
It's like you, you, you recognize that, you're, that the awareness isn't quite on, on target. And then just bring the name in and to correct it. And then as soon, and as soon as you're on target again, drop it. Sometimes it's useful when the territory is completely new. When, when things have shifted, there's something going on, but you're quite unfamiliar with it, and you're not quite sure what it is. And then it's like you can toss a name in. It's like um, you, you, you toss a name in, no, nah, that's not it. You try another one, no, nah, you try another one, bingo. That's what it is. And that's enough, because you're back on target. So different people have different relationships with the naming. Some people use it a lot, some people just use it hardly at all. But whenever you do use it, it's about aim. If, if you can aim accurately without it, you don't need it. Playful awareness. Um, I think being playful is very important because if you're being playful, you're not taking yourself so seriously. You know, we, we, we take ourselves extremely seriously. But playfulness arises when you don't take yourself so seriously. It's like when you recognise it's, it's not that serious, it's not that heavy. The self takes itself very seriously. So when we're caught up in self, it's very serious. But when, as the more you, 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 the more you go through, the more, you, the more experience you get, the more storms you go through, the more you recognise that I don't actually have to take this seriously, it's just another storm. And then you can start to actually enjoy it. Uh, in a perverse kind of way, I mean. You know. <laughs> but it becomes interesting. It becomes very interesting. It's like, what's been afflicting me for so long? It's like I've become genuinely curious about it now. What is this? What, what does it feel like? What's it doing? And by having this investigation, it's like I'm separating myself from it. And it becomes this... It's like when you, you know, people enjoy horror movies. You, know, you enjoy being scared because there's that sense of separation. Or they enjoy tra watching tragedies. They go to movies and have a good weep. It's a great movie. I really wept. You know. it, it, it's, it's, rather the, it's rather similar because it's like you, it's being played out on a screen. And so that's the, the, the um, to me, that's the playful aspect. But it comes, it, it comes when you get a bit of space between you, you and yourself. And the more space that develops over time, the less seriously you take yourself, the more playful the meditation becomes and the more playful life becomes. Yeah. Mm. If it, to me, if it's if I say it's if I, if it's personal, it's immensely important, and there's no escape from it. Like this must define my life. Whereas if it's not personal, yeah, this to me implies I don't have to identify with it. And therefore, there's an escape from it. There's an exit from it. It's like being, 
It's like if you watch a movie and imagine being one of the characters in the movie, trapped to repeat that movie. Every time someone runs the DVD, you've got to go through the same thing all over again. And there's no escape. That's taking it personally. Yeah, we ought to, it's, of course, but it, it comes about through the practice, through this developing sense of emptiness, of not-self. You have to see the emptiness of the emotion in order to recognise it. That's what the practice is all about, in the moment that it's there, recognising that it's empty. Not, not thinking about it afterwards, but when it's actually there, playing itself out, seeing in that moment it's emptiness, and that's what's liberating. And then when it comes up again, we kept, kept, kept being sucked in, but it's much easier to, to, to wake up from it, you know, to be caught up in something and suddenly realise, oh my God, I'm, I'm really taking myself seriously here, and suddenly it's gone. Not because we want it to go, or trying to make it go, it just goes. I've got a few exercises in exploring chitta. Shall we do them? If you're working with body, there's always body sensation. If you're working with chitta, there's always chitta, but it's, it's a, it can be much more subtle, so these exercises may be a bit touch artificial. But we'll try them anyway, just as in the spirit of exploration. So if you get into the meditation posture, feeling the body, It's feeling the whole body and settling into the posture. Tuning into your normal meditation object. And then ask yourself, how am I now? How are you now? Feel the answer. There's no need for words, but if one arises, it might be useful to clarify it. How am I now? And then ask yourself, do you want anything now? Is there anything now you would like to have? 
If so, what does it feel like to want? And if there's nothing that you want, what does it feel like to be without wanting? Now ask yourself, is there anything about this situation now that you dislike? Is there anything happening now that you dislike? If so, what does it feel like to dislike? And if not, what does it feel like to be without disliking? As you're being asked about your inner state, are you confused or doubtful about what it is or about what's going on? If so, what does it feel like to not know what's going on? And if not, if you are clear about what's going on, what does it feel like to be clear about what's going on? Are you doubtful or confused or not?
And now reflect back on these exercises. Of the three basic movements, wanting, disliking, confusion, which one was clearest to you? Which one was most difficult and obscure? So how did it go? Anything happen? So, so in this case, desire is painful. Yeah. Mm. But then, then it's finished. Then it's okay. It's painful. Mm. Um, that's why it's just stayed in for that one. Mm. It didn't even dissolve. It's mm. like water. So that's it. Mm. It's pain there. Mm. Yeah, it's getting, the exercise is getting to know the nature of wanting and the nature of disliking. These are the, the basic movements. What does it feel like to want? What does it feel like to dislike? No, it's just, what is it? <coughs> What's the we all have wanting, we all have disliking, we all have delusion and confusion. Mm -hmm. What is it like? just to get in touch with it and to feel it. And it might be interesting to see which one is clearest, which one is most obvious. Anyone else? So, so confusion was 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 the strongest and clearest. Yeah. And what's it like to be confused? Yeah. So, so it's a so it's a very agitated, movement-oriented kind of state. This, that, this, that, this, that. Do, 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 do. Restless. Yeah. Sounds like you've got a good hit of confusion. <laughs> the, uh, the point of the exercise, of course, is not, well, is essentially just getting to know, beginning to tune into these, these basic movements of the citta and what they are and what they feel like. Don't 
try to conjure anything up. Just look and see, is there something here? If there isn't, there isn't. And if there is, what's here is what's here. What we keep trying to do is we keep expecting, oh, there should be something here. And I should be manipulating it to make it come. And this is, our, this is the self, constantly trying to control and manipulate the situation. But actually it's just, well, what is here? What is it? And what does it feel like? And what's it doing? That's all. It's about being clear on what's going on. But the exercise is kind of directing the awareness, sending the awareness in different directions. To have a look. What, is there anything here? No. Anything here? No. Anything here? Oh, here's something. Yes, it's, it's very, in, in, the, in the meditation practice, there's very much a question of developing a sensitivity to what's going on inside. One way of looking at chitta is chitta is the inner space, the space within us, and there's lots happening in it, and becoming sensitive to what, what is happening inside is extremely important in the meditation practice. Okay, that's enough for this morning. <laughs>